First and foremost, uh, thank you, Greg. Uh, I, I don't take it lightly to be able to stand up behind uh, this pulpit, this lectern. Um, it means a lot that you uh, trust me. Thanks. So, see how much you trust me afterwards. But right now, we're good. <laughs> so far, so good. Um, for those that don't know me, well, let me back up a second. I, I was in a church about 10 years ago who actually went through something very similar that we went through. They, they lost their building. They were sued. Very similar process. And uh, we got connected to the Ugandan church. And what was really neat is we had bishops and priests that would actually travel to Savannah and preach. And one of the things they did right off the bat was they would give a testimony before they began, which I thought was excellent. So now we know exactly where this person stands. I know most of you in here, but for those that don't, hi, I'm Joey. Uh, I'm the youth pastor here. I've been here for about a year and a half. And uh, let me just give you a fast testimony. Uh, I was born and raised in North Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Uh, Christian parents. I was uh, raised in a Baptist church. And uh, my mom and dad still go to the same church, and, uh, and they, they taught me the gospel. They taught me who Jesus was. And uh, here's the fastest version of my testimony I can give you. It's this. Uh, Jesus Christ took my sin, my judgment, and my death, which I worked really hard to earn. And he took, uh, exchanged it for his life, his freedom, and his forgiveness, which he worked very hard. Um, and he gave me what he earned, and, and I got to give him my death. Um, and I thank my Lord and Savior that, that he revealed himself to me. But that's who I am. Let's pray real quick. And please pray for me as well as, uh, as I'm talking. Father God, thank you for being a loving God. Please speak through me this, this morning. Uh, give me the words to say. Thank you for the time of study and the time of looking at this text. Um, but also, just, just help me to go through it well as you want me to. Help me to hear you, and uh, I ask you to bless the, my mouth, and bless the ears, and bless the hearts that hear. Just let me pray. Amen. I don't think it was any coincidence that uh, we just went through the book of Philippians. I don't think it's any coincidence that halfway through a book of joy, our church sort of got hit in the gut. I don't think it's any coincidence that we went through a time of maybe turmoil, maybe some fear, maybe some stress while we were studying a book about joy. And I don't think it's any coincidence that the author of Philippians is Paul, a guy who was actually suffering while he wrote a book about joy. I just think it's great that we as a church got to study a, a, a book that was about joy while the guy writing was suffering. I think that's something we can really learn, that we can have joy in suffering. That ended, and then we went directly into this week, and I also don't think it's any coincidence that we jumped right back into the lectionary, and the scripture that we're using today is about Jesus talking about the institution of the church. I don't think that's a coincidence. I think God wanted us to know what it means to be joy in suffering, and I think he wants us to know what church is about. I don't think any of that is a coincidence. Um, Let's reread. This is Matthew 16, 13 through 20. This is our gospel reading. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And who, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. In order to begin this, in verse 18, where, where Jesus mentions, I will build the church, understand uh, the translation of that word church is assembly. So he's talking about us, the groups of Christians that get together. And I think in this uh, text, it gives two characteristics of the church, of the people that are in the church. The first is this, the church is assembly of people who know Jesus intimately, who know Jesus intimately. And the church is assembly of people who confess Jesus with confidence, who confess Jesus 
with confidence. So let's talk about that and know uh, Jesus intimately first. There's a great contrast right there in Matthew 16. Earlier in the chapter, you're going to see the Sadducees and the Pharisees and clearly people that don't have an intimate relationship with Jesus uh, just combating with the apostles, combating with Jesus. And in our reading today, you see the same sort of combating with the people in the world, the crowd. Jesus asked the question, who do the people say that I am? And they come up with some decent answers. Maybe he's John the Baptist, maybe he's Elijah, he's a great teacher, maybe a prophet, he seems like a good guy. Maybe he's one of these guys come back, or maybe he's kind of like one of these guys. But nobody says he's the Messiah. And he turns it around on his apostles and he says, okay, then who do you say that I am? And he says it to the whole group. Who do you guys say that I am? And Peter, like in his normal character, jumps out and speaks first. And usually when Peter speaks first, he puts his foot in his mouth, but this time he gets it right. And he says, you are the son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the one the scriptures talked about. You are the Christ. And Jesus responds with, you didn't figure this out on your own. God revealed it to you. Have you ever talked to someone about Jesus? And when you got done speaking with them, they just didn't get it. You you knew they should have got it, but they didn't get it. Or have you ever seen God work in someone's life and they just didn't understand that it was God working. They just didn't realize it. When I was a kid, I struggled with doubt and I struggled with wanting to feel the presence of God and I wanted God to show me some evidence. And I prayed for God to show me evidence. I prayed for him to reveal himself in some way. And all the different ways I set God up to reveal himself, he never would do what I asked him to do. He wouldn't play my games. But I went to Sunday school one week and they were teaching on Gideon 6, or uh, Judges 6, which is the story of Gideon. And Gideon does this very neat thing. He takes this fleece, a fabric, and he puts it outside and he tells God, in the morning, I want you to show, basically prove yourself and I want you to show that uh, fleece to be dry and the ground around it to be wet. And he got up in the morning and sure enough, the fleece was dry the ground was wet. And then he says, you know, God, I'm sorry to do this twice. I don't mean to doubt you, but let's do it again. This time I want the fleece to be wet and the ground to be dry. And God did exactly what he said. So I knew what I had to do. I went in my mom's linen cabinet and I got some of her really good washcloths. And I went out about six o'clock at night and I laid one of those washcloths out on the ground and I went to bed. I knew God was showing up the next morning. And I went outside and I picked up that fleece and sure enough, it was wet. And the ground around it, well, that was wet too. So it didn't work. So I said, okay, clearly I didn't pray this right. Let's try this again. And I went to bed that night. I put the fleece back out, the washcloth back out. And I got up in the morning. And this time the ground was wet. And the fleece was wet too. Yeah, it it, it didn't work. God, God never played my games. Here's the funny thing though. Have you seen creation? And you got evidence of God. Do you have the ability to gather knowledge in your brain? Then you have the evidence of God. Do you have a moral code? A moral code is evidence of a moral law giver. And then we look at Jesus, God's son, who who sent to die in our praise to take away our sin. He took away our judgment and death and replaced it with forgiveness of life. We have all the evidence we need. It's so silly to consider standing in front of Almighty God, standing in front of his throne and looking at him and saying, if you're just giving me a sign... One of my favorite verses is Romans 1.20. It says, since the beginning of the world, God's invisible qualities is, uh, I said it wrong, so I'll do it. Since there is invisible attributes, namely his internal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so they're without excuse. So what that basically says is, if you've seen a sunrise, if you've seen the ocean, if you've seen an eclipse, you've seen the evidence of God. You've seen... You've got that evidence. You've been proven. You've got it. I got four kids in my house, and uh, I pray that they all come to know God. And I'm very happy to know that the two boys sitting back there with my wife uh, have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And that has been a great blessing, a great gift to me to see that happen. And, And in our house with our four kids, we really encourage them to a relationship with Jesus. We work really hard to get them saved. We pray over dinner, we talk about the Bible, we use phrases like glorify God a lot, we recite the New City Catechism at night so they can get it. We work hard to get them saved. But, Matthew 16, 17 says this, Jesus says to Peter, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. 
James and Nolan back there. James and Nolan, blessed are you. Because the prayers over dinner, it talks about the Bible, the phrases like glorify God and reciting the New City Catechism, all that stuff's good. But that hasn't revealed this to you. My Father revealed it to you in heaven. So let that give you comfort. Whether you've got kids younger than mine or my age or you have grown up kids, let that give you comfort that if they don't know Jesus, it doesn't mean you've messed up. Let that give you comfort. Keep telling them the Bible, but understand before they're your child, they're God's child. Let that give you comfort that it's his responsibility to reveal himself to them. Also, if you talk to a friend, you talk to a family member, and they just don't get it, let it give you comfort that it's not your responsibility, it's God's responsibility to reveal himself to you, to them, excuse me. And also, when people who don't understand the identity of God, and otherwise, a definition of someone who is not the church, comes in and attacks the church, it's our responsibility to not get angry. We only know God because God revealed himself to us. We have no room for arrogance. We did nothing to earn this. We did nothing. Pray for those who attack us. Pray for those who do not yet know God. Pray for those that are coming after us and pray that God reveals himself to them. So, the church is an assembly of people who know God intimately. And secondly, the church is an assembly of people who confess Jesus with confidence. So here was the difficult verse, the one I wrestled with and had to do some studying and kind of arguing. It says this, And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell should not prevail against it. So what does it mean, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church? It can be a little confusing because that term rock is used in some other places. Uh, sometimes Jesus is talked about as the rock. Uh, sometimes Jesus talks about the cornerstone. Sometimes the apostles are talked about as a foundation. Even Paul himself refers to himself as a master builder when talking about building the church. But in this context, what is the rock? Well, is the church uh, built on Peter? Is it built on the apostles? Is it built on the gospel? Or is it built on Jesus? So Jesus looks at the apostle, whose name is Simon, and he says this, you are now Peter, which translated means rock. And then he says, on this rock I'll build my church. So clearly there's some connection with Peter, but why would you want to build your church on a guy like Peter? Look at what he just said a second ago. He said this, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Peter confesses Christ as the Messiah, and immediately Jesus says, this is the foundation on which I want to build the church. The church is built on people of faith proclaiming that Christ is the Messiah. Martin Luther even said, all who agree with the confession of Peter in Matthew 16 are Peter's themselves setting a sure foundation. So we can actually be part of that foundation building church as we become people or be people that confess that Jesus is the Messiah. So the rock, it is Jesus. It is the gospel of Jesus and it's the people confessing the gospel of Jesus. The next piece, on this rock I shall build my church, and it says, and then the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The phrase, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, is actually a Jewish term that just means death can't kill it. And that's true, for, first off, with the Messiah. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus uh, tells that he's going to die, um, and, and death can't kill the Messiah. But it's also true for the church. A church that knows Christ intimately and confesses him confidently, death can't kill that church. J.C. Ryle said, Nothing can altogether overthrow and destroy the church. Its members may be persecuted, oppressed, imprisoned, beaten, beheaded, burned, but the true church is never altogether extinguished. It rises again from its afflictions. It lives on through fire and water. When crushed in one land, it springs up another. The pharaohs, the Herods, the Neros have labored in vain to put down this church. They slay their thousands and then pass away and go on to their own place. The true church outlives them all and sees them buried, each in its turn. It is an anvil that has broken many a hammer in this world and it will break a hammer still. It is a bush which is also burning and is not consumed. Death can't kill the Messiah and death can't kill this church. And we know this because we've been given authority. The next verse says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. This is the reason why most jokes start off, uh, most Christian jokes start off, so a guy goes to heaven and meets St. Peter at the pearly gates. I would argue that it's not Peter holding the keys, but actually the keys are held by people that confess the Messiah. My kids love Legos a lot. And in, in the boys' room, they have these two giant tubs. They're about that long by that long and about that deep. Two of them stocked full of Legos. 
and both of them have a lock on it that go to this key. I hold the key. <laughs> and I hold the key for a few reasons. I want to control exactly, first off, how often they're playing, their playtime. We're homeschool people, so you know, they'd be playing Legos all day long if we let them. I also want to control how messy their room gets. And I also want to control how many of those things I step on when I'm in their room at night, which is just horrible. But every now and then, I'll take my keys and I'll hand it to one of my kids. And I give them my authority. And at that moment, they have the authority to open one box. Maybe they can open two boxes. They can take things out. They can put things in. If they're real jerks, and they sometimes are, they can say who gets to play and who doesn't. But I hand them my authority. So when you read, I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Remember the context. The context is the apostles, specifically Peter, confessing Jesus as Messiah. Jesus has the authority to save sinners, and Jesus has the authority to judge sinners. And he doesn't give us the authority to save and judge, but he does give us the authority to say that if you turn your life over and trust in Jesus, you will be saved. And if you don't turn your life over and trust in Jesus, you won't be saved. We have the authority to say that, and we have the authority to know that's true, that people that do confess Jesus, they get to connect to God. We have that authority. So what are you supposed to do with Matthew 16? Well, first off, know this. The church is an assembly of people who know Jesus intently. And the things that we know, we know that Jesus is the Messiah who willingly died in our place. He took our sin. He took our judgment. He took our death. He replaced it with life, forgiveness, and freedom. He pardoned you and he pardoned me. Do you know Jesus intimately? And secondly, know that the church is an assembly of people who confess Jesus with confidence. Do you confess that stuff we just said we know? Do you confess with confidence? If your answer is no, I've got three things for you. Do this for me, okay? Abstain from taking communion today. Walk up, do this, give the pastor a moment to pray over you. That's the first piece. Secondly, uh, speak to Father Greg, speak to the vestry. We actually have prayer team folks as well. You can walk up to them and actually say the phrase, I don't know Christ intimately, or I'm struggling in this confessing thing um, and doing it confidently. C could you pray with me over that? And, and finally, we all have connect cards. Write on your connect card, I would like to know Jesus intimately or I don't or I'm struggling confessing. And when we get in our team meetings every week, we will pray for you. And secondly, if you said yes, then it should give you hope. It should give you hope that you can't kill the Messiah. And it should give you hope that no matter what building we are in, you can't kill the church. Please stand.